Welcome to Spirits of Whiskey. We explore the wide world of whiskey through the many colorful personalities who make it, promote it, write about it, and more. With each podcast, Carrie Moynihan, a certified bourbon steward and bartender, and yours truly, Philip Dobar, director of the Cocktail Collection, interview whiskey's most important names. From high-profile makers, blenders, and ambassadors, to out-of-the-way innovators and remote pioneers. Join us as we discover the people and elements that give the water of life its spirit. It is June 3rd, 2021, and you're listening to episode 44. Today, we speak with new book author Daniel Shore, founder of Cotswold Distillery in England. But first, stay tuned for this week's Whiskey Chronicles. Spirits of Whiskey explores the wide world of whiskey through high-profile and out-of-the-way makers, blenders, writers, ambassadors, innovators, and pioneers. And we've been traveling the world virtually to bring these people and their whiskey journeys to you. We realize just how many great stories we've put aside to share with you at a later date. And that date is here. Spirits of Whiskey is offering access to its new VIP content page to loyal listeners and whiskey lovers who want more. And when it comes to whiskey, who doesn't want more? For as little as 99 cents a month, you can have access to videos related to topics discussed on past podcasts, as well as our new series, The Malting Floor. Sign up now to become a supporter at anchor.fm slash spirits hyphen of hyphen whiskey. That's whiskey with an E. Click on the support button and select the contribution level that's right for you. Once you've submitted your payment information, just visit our website, spiritsofwhiskey.com, to create your personal VIP access account. We can't wait to see you in the VIP lounge. Join us. English whiskey. It's a thing. Although, until 2003... When Cornwall's St. Austell Brewery and Healy's Cider Farm joined forces to create Hicks and Healy and distill the first whiskey produced in England since 1905, when London's Lee Valley Distillery extinguished the flames firing its sills, it wasn't. A thing, that is. Then, in 2006, the English whiskey company opened St. George's Distillery in Norfolk. And while the Hicks and Healy partnership predates the English Whiskey Company, the latter released its first juice in 2009, a full two years before the former brought to market the first whiskey produced in the culturally distinctive English county of Cornwall in over 300 years. And now, in 2021, well, there are no fewer than 24 English distilleries producing whiskey, with many more in various stages of permitting and development. Among them is Cotswolds Distillery, operated by the Cotswold Distilling Company and its founder, Daniel Shore. And of the 24 distilleries currently operating in England, what makes Cotswold's distillery unique? Well, for one thing, it's the first, and so far only, distillery located in the Cotswolds, named for the Cotswold Hills, which run through this picturesque area of south-central England known for its striking natural beauty. And for another, its founder and CEO, this episode's guest as it happens, is no Englishman. Rather, he's an American, a New Yorker, in fact, who, after a career in finance, decided to pursue the whiskey bug he developed while working in Paris in what no one with an appreciation for the term would characterize as retirement. The renaissance in English whiskey making tracks the renaissance in whiskey making across the British Isles. While Scotland never turned its back on its centuries-old whiskey-making tradition, developers and distillers are now hard at work creating new brands, as well as resurrecting old ones and refurbishing shuttered distilleries across the country. In Ireland, where the number of whiskey producers had fallen from many hundreds in the 19th century to four at the turn of the 21st, there are now nearly three dozen in operation, with dozens more planned and coming online in the not-too-distant. And now in Wales, there are five whiskey makers, including the subject of a future episode of this podcast, the Welsh Whiskey Company and its Penderyn Distillery, producers of the first commercially available whiskey made in Wales since the late 19th century. To these gloriously liquid developments, we at Spirits of Whiskey can say only cheers. Up next, we speak with Daniel Shore. Stay with us. Hey guys, we're back, finally, after COVID-19. I'm Carrie. I'm Philip. I'm Louise, I'm the chef. Chef Louise Leonard, as in Whiskey, A Chef's Journey. That chef. Yes, we started shooting just before the pandemic lockdown, and now today, our very first day, you are catching us on set, and we would love to talk to you about how you can help get us from here to your TV set. 
The thing is, we've run out of money. We mounted a pre-production campaign, which was very successful. Thank you very much for that. But now, we're back into production, and we need your support for this phase. You supported this uh, the first go-round, or if you didn't, we welcome your support this time. The thing is, we want to take this show around the world, quite literally. Quite literally. And that takes money. Yes. So, won't you help us get this to market? You can visit whiskeyachefsjourney.com for all of the information you're going to need to help us realize this project. Well, I, I think it's a cheers to that. <laughs> cheers. cheers. Today on Spirits of Whiskey, our guest is Mr. Daniel Shore. Daniel is founder and CEO of the Cotswold Distilling Company Limited in Stourton, England. And among the many characteristics that distinguish Daniel from other UK whiskey makers is his charming American accent. Welcome, Daniel. It's great to be here. Great to be here. I, I always tell Brit that it's a West Country accent, but really far west. I mean, you know, uh, really far west, as I in New York. Okay. Yes, you are a native of New York. I am born and raised. So if you're born and raised in Manhattan, how did you end up a whiskey maker and author in the UK? I guess it's 30 years and a yeah, slightly loveless career. It wasn't all that bad. It was actually a really good, good career, but nothing like what I'm doing right now. But it did take me from... It's better than uh, thoroughly loveless because many people are stuck in that. Yeah, I, it was... It was a great bunch of folks. It was a great little company. It was just, it was not necessarily in the kind of field that uh, I would have picked for myself. You do what you do when you get out of school, kind of, and you go for what seems to make sense. And in the 80s, a lot of folks like me who were getting out of college were heading to Wall Street. It was uh, that era. And I found myself, after having interned at a bank, gotten up getting a job on the on their FX trading desk, on their foreign exchange trading desk. And the 80s was that sort of era where markets were ruling. And after a few years of doing that, I thought, yeah, it's not really for me. I'm going to go back to business school. But I got an offer from a startup company that was doing currency forecasting and consulting. And it seemed like worth taking the summer off and, and trying before school. And the three months turned into 26 years. But basically... After it got a little bit boring, after a few years, I asked them if I could um, become their European marketing guy so I could go off and live in Paris for a while, I'm always a Francophile. And they said yes. And that got me 11 years in Paris, still not loving what I did, but loving where I did it. And that being a bit of a, a foodie and a drinky, I was in my element and I did what most American expats do their first few years, get in the car every weekend, go off to some wine producing area or go to the cheese show, etc. And that's where my real love of sort of provenance and terroir got started. That's um, heaven on earth for a foodie. Yeah. And I thought that the French really, they were the ones who invented the concept. And yet uh, something happened to me in early 2000, which made me realize that there was one, one area in which they weren't masters. And that was an evening at the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society in Paris, introductory evening, where I discovered the delights of single cask whiskey, cask strength whiskey. And I realized that in this kind of quirky, every cask is different, every distillery is different, that actually the Scots were a step ahead of the French when it came to spirits in terms of really that focus on flavor, on terroir, on, on where it came from, how it was made. And that's where my kind of love affair with whiskey began. Now, most people who do that don't end up making whiskey or owning a distillery. But that's another story. And that takes us to the UK, where I finally moved our European office to, still with my old firm. And I was remarried to a, a British woman and we lived in London. And some personal issues made us reevaluate a little bit and say, what, what's really important in life? And my wife, who's a neurologist, works just as hard as I did in the city, as they call finance in the UK. And we were like ships in the night and then all of a sudden we get sick. And I thought, what's, what can we do to make our lives better? And the answer was get a farmhouse so we can go live in on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. We were city people. We thought the country is only something you do on Saturday and Sunday. Never would I have expected to, you know, <laughs> happiness here and living in the middle of nowhere. But we bought this little farmhouse on two acres of land surrounded by a huge farm and then cut to post-2007. Foreign exchange wasn't doing really well. And my firm all of a sudden looked like it might not survive. And I thought, I've been using this little firm as an excuse to stay in my loveless career for years and years. And if they go under and I just go down the street, get a job at the next head fund, that's me. That's the ultimate capitulation. I got to think about what I really can do. And that led to the barley. 
And that was in the summer of 2012. I was looking out the window of our farmhouse here at a field of malting barley, spring barley that had grown. It was just blowing in the breeze. And I suddenly thought they make a lot of barley here in the Cotswolds, but no one's ever made any whiskey. So why not be the first to do it? There's your story. Good. So the so first Cotswolds distillery. Absolutely. A perfect place for it because it's got the barley and it's got 30 million visitors a year. So destination distillery. That was what I, after all my experience in Scotland, people like to come and tour distilleries and there's a lot of people coming to the Cotswolds. It's like the Vermont of the UK. Kind of. It's that green, happy place. It's not too mm -hmm. far away from the <laughs> yeah. country. And when you need to get out of town, that's where you go. So when you looked at these barley fields and said, let's do whiskey, what year was this? And what did your wife say when you said, I'm going to forget the finance and make some whiskey? The epiphany moment was this summer. It was July, 2012. And I actually didn't tell my wife. In fact, I didn't tell anyone. I just said that <laughs> weekend post Sunday lunch kind of dreaming and rambling. And I forgot about it until we had a Christmas party that year. And I, I got a little drunk. I, I had a couple of drinks. I started rattling off to a friend and I mentioned this idea and he was just so blown away. Said, you, that's great. You've got to do it. And I started thinking maybe it's not such a crazy idea. And the next moment was in April of 13. I went to Whiskey Live in New York City because I was back home for a week. And what I realized was that half of the people in that room, half of the exhibitors were whiskey to soda I'd never heard of. And I said, what's going on here? These guys aren't from Scotland. They're not from Ireland. They're not from Kentucky. They're from like Oregon and Boston and Brooklyn. And that was when I first realized what mm -hmm. was going on in craft distilling. And so I suddenly pulled that other idea from the previous summer out of my head. And I thought what works in the States eventually crosses over to the UK. So maybe there is something to be done. So it got me one step further, but the final step was the benediction. And that was basically the benediction from Jim McEwen, a well-known former production director at Brook Laddie, which was a wonderful distillery on Isla, mm -hmm. um, where my best friend and I on one of our boys weekend whiskey journeys went to have a tour and Jim gave us a tour and Jim can sell snow to the Eskimos. He's the greatest salesman. We walked out of that tour owning a barrel of Brook Laddie. And then Brook Laddie became like our home wow. team. We followed it for 10 years until its exit to where it sold to Remy Cointreau. But Jim was the only guy I really knew in whiskey. I was just a sort of a, a whiskey geek and a sort of a whiskey consumer. So we were going up to Isla to check, check out our barrel, give it the yearly hug. It was 10 years old by then. And I asked to see Jim and I said, you, you probably don't remember me because now you're like a rock star at 500 people per masterclass and all this, but I'm the guy you sold a barrel to 10 years ago. And I've been following you guys and I'm just so, I love what you're doing so much. I'm thinking about building a little distillery in the Cotswolds of all places, making probably, but if you tell me I'm nuts, I'll walk out of here and never think about it again. And the beauty of Jim is again, his romance and his character. And he said, ah, oh, lad, it's your dream. You've got to follow your dream. And so I did. And Jim then basically said, I, I, any way I can help you, he said, the guy who I used to work for at Bomore, who used to be the general manager of Bomore back in the 80s, Harry Coburn, is now retired from the whiskey business, but he helps start up distillers. And so he introduced me to Harry. And that's really how the whole project got going, was this 77-year-old Scott with 50 years in the whiskey business and this slightly but not very younger American guy. So that's how it all started. Harry was incredible. We came one month after Jim McEwen's benediction and go for it, do it. Harry came down to meet me in the Cotswolds with his wife. They drove down from, they lived just outside of Edinburgh and we just hit it off. And I'm a big believer that things happen for a reason. The karma was just there. And literally a week after that first meeting with Harry, he and I were on a plane to Sweden to go look at some used distilling equipment. The whole distillery actually was up for sale. We didn't go for that, uh, thankfully. We didn't think we would get would be able to get the kind of stills that I wanted, which were copper pots from Forsyth's in Speyside in, in, in Rothes. And one thing led to another, and we were able to get ourselves our copper pot stills. And so we got our, our copper pots from Forsyth. And more than that, we Forsyth ended up designing the entire distillery. So it wasn't just the mash ton and the washback and the boiler, but they actually sent a whole squad down from Scotland who were at the distillery for two months and did all the pipe work and all the electrics over the summer of 2014. So we have the equivalent in terms of quality of the sort of distillery you'd see pipe pumping out two, three million liters in Scotland only. We can only pump out about 125,000 liters a year, but it's small, but perfectly formed just like every other mm -hmm. part of our, our little distillery. That's awesome. Yeah. That's very awesome. Yeah. So what was the first, first whiskey you guys made and when did that come off the still and how soon 
was it available after the barrel was ready? So Forsyth told us that we were one of the fastest commissioning jobs that they had ever done. Commissioning being the whole process. It's one thing when you deliver everything and you plop it down on the floor, but then you got to hook it up, do the electrics, do the pipe work and everything. The stills were delivered June 24th, 2014. Our first mash was September 5th. So it was like 10 weeks. Kind wow. of. Um, That's we a actually, quick turnaround. But um, so September 5th was our first mash. <laughs> And then we called it the Moonlight Mash, actually, because it took so long to get everything ready and the Forsyth guys were still there doing the last things. We didn't actually mash in until I think sort of five o'clock in the evening. And we have a great photo of tipping the draft bin out into a big skip outside with the full moon out in the background. So it was the Moonlight Mash. It was, a, we didn't finish the one or two in the morning, but we then cast our first cast on the 22nd of September, 2014. And three years later, that was officially whiskey by EU law. And I think about three or four weeks after that was when we launched our first inaugural release. So the time to amass enough casks to put together into that first release. Yeah. Wow. You held some back uh, for longer aging? Oh, yeah. We still have a couple of six-year-old now, I guess, casks. When we started out, we... We were working one shift a day, but seven days a week. So one mash and one run of both stills. And then in 2016, we went double shifts. So now we're mashing 14 times a week, twice a day, um, seven days a week. And we're really pushing that little, this little kit that we've got as hard as it can. And we're putting out three barrels a day. But in the first year, we were only putting out a barrel and a half a day. Given the sort of popularity, because the whiskey has been really selling well, it's hard to hold on the stock from those first two years. But from 16, more stock came on board. And uh, who knows? We may find ourselves upping production in another year or two just to keep up with, with the demand. Okay. Now, you make a number of, you produce a number of liqueurs and variously botanicized gins as well. Have you been making those from the get-go as well? We have, and that's where one of the real big surprises came in for the distillery because whiskey was the reason I built this distillery. Whiskey was always where my heart, my passion was. It's also what I thought made the most business sense. But it doesn't make a lot of business sense when you're starting out. In fact, when you talk about working capital requirements, I, I wouldn't wish whiskey on my worst enemy. I mean, you know, it's you're talking about three years minimum in terms of the time that your capital has been mobilized. You know, you're buying bat casks and you're, you know, it's, it's really tough. It gets easier once you pass that. But Cotswolds Dry Gin, as you're showing us here, is uh, was part of the answer to our questions, but it was an unlikely thing. It was just really... We thought if we want to get visitors to come in the distillery, we need to have something on the shelves to sell them and the whiskey wouldn't be ready for three years. So we thought we'd make some gin. And whereas with the whiskey, we had two brilliant Scottish guys, Harry Coburn, and then Dr. Jim Swan, who's like the Einstein of whiskey, helping us from the chemistry point of view on the flavor. I mean, we really, we were so lucky that we had a Harry and Jim together on the project. But where gin was concerned, we didn't have a Harry or Jim Swan. I just had three very young distillers with varying amounts of experience, but generally not a lot, who had two months of time on their hands because they started work on the 1st of July, 2014, and the distillery wasn't really ready for use until the 5th of September. So what to do with three guys on the payroll? Well, lock them in our little lab. We had a small lab, give them a one liter still each and a list of 150 different botanicals to try on the road to finding a great gin, wow. which kind of reflects the Cotswolds. And how do you do that? They manage it in about a month's time to distill through 150 botanicals one by one. So we have 150 bottles of uh, individual one botanical. Philip, are you having the gin already? I'm having the gin, yes. All right, hold on. Let me have the gin now. I for thought gin, we were going to do the uh, gin last, but I'll pour it. Forgive for interrupting. I'm sorry. I just can't, I oh. can't help myself here. It's, it's magnificent. And, Please and, continue. <laughs> and yeah, one of the most fun things to do too is just to nose that glass too. A, a great spirit oh, yeah. to me is something you can have a lot of fun with. Even after you've had the last sip, you can just sit there watching a movie and just nosing a glass. And the oils are so thick and viscous that it stays in the glass and that's what this gin is all about so 150 botanical distillations 60 60 different prototype gins 12 wow. semi-finalists three finalists and then we ended up with what you have in your glass and that ended up being a classic london dry style gin meaning that everything was distilled in the still in the pot and it's a pretty straightforward conception it's got its juniper coriander angelica base but then there's a couple of things that are different First mm -hmm. of all, all the citrus in there and its pink grapefruit and lime is actually hand peeled. And that seemed like a good idea in the beginning because you get so much more oil out of hand peeled. When you get to the size that we are now and you find yourself peeling, 
500 grapefruits and 800 limes a week by hand, literally with a paring knife. It gets to be problematic, but we've got a squad of peelers that, that do just that. But it's not just those oils. Wow. Mm-hmm. There's also some local lavender from the Cotswolds, which is the real English garden kind of twist, the Cotswold Swift. Mm-hmm. But one of our distillers basically yeah. had the idea that if Dan wants big flavors, how about if I just put in 10 times the amount of botanicals that anyone else would ever put in their right mind? And that's exactly what he did. So we've got 10 times the amount of botanicals by weight. And what that does is when you add a little bit of water or tonic or ice, it goes cloudy. And you guys will understand that concept. They call it a louche. And in the beginning, I said, gosh, what are we going to do about that? That's not what a gin's supposed to do. And I thought, but that is what a single malt's supposed to do if it's a really good unfiltered whiskey. And we're a bunch of whiskey guys making gin, so why not? Let's embrace that. And so we make a cloudy gin. And what we find is that people really respect that. We basically put more in so you get more out, and people get that concept. I love it. They're refreshed. They're revivified. I do get the grapefruit and the lavender on the nose. And it. this is... Fantastic. I, I, this is probably one of the best London dries I've had. I really like right? it. Right? Am I right? Isn't that magnificent? You make a number of gins. This is a, a, on your website. I think we can see upwards of three, four, or five even. Yeah. Yeah. We went a little. I, there's a certain impatience that you have when you're a whiskey maker and you're waiting to come into your whiskey. And there's a creative impatience and you just want to do yeah. cool things and fun things. And let's face it, distilling is fun. And there's just so many way directions you can take it. On the gin side, you know, what's wonderful about gin is that it really is that neutral grain spirit is a blank palette onto which you can project so many different expressions. Our second gin was actually a Geneva. So it was actually a gin made with our whiskey new make spirit uh-huh. and cascaged, gauged. And that was a lot of fun. Our third gin was mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Something called uh, Baharat, which was a Middle Eastern themed gin with a lot of cardamom and cumin and chili and Jaffa orange. Then we did hedgerow gin, which is our take on a slow gin, because we were basically in the hedgerows. We had lots of fruit left and center. And that was all hand-picked fruit mastered our gin for a year. We did a ginger gin, which is, as the name implies, a lot of ginger, an old Tom gin. So yeah, yeah the list goes on, but we're I'm I'm starting to calm down now. I'm, I'm realizing that uh, I heard a word the other day I'd never heard of. Like, <laughs> Skewmageddon, which is when you have too many products. Skew- I've been told. That's beautiful. I, I would, is the malt Geneva still available? It is. And it, it we've got a lot of casks aging, but it won't be made again because the problem is that every cask of that is a cask less new make spirit that can become Cotswold single malt, which we now realize we sure. don't need every right. bit we sure. have. But there are probably about 30, 40 casks still around. Quick, quick question before we move on to the whiskeys. What is the base of the gin? The neutral spirit is distilled from? So it's 100% wheat. We are completely transparent. We do not make it. In EU law says that gin has to be made from a 96% neutral grain spirit, which is by legal definition, odorless, colorless, and flavorless. Okay. So whiskey, 2014 Odyssey Barley. Yes. Talk to us about Odyssey Barley. What does that mean? So Odyssey- and did you source any of the whiskeys to blend into this, or this is all stuff that you guys produced? No, no, we've never sourced a drop of whiskey. We don't believe in awesome. that. Um, everything. I, I just can't make. believe how good this is for such a young whiskey. I'm just so impressed. Thank, thank you very much. True to the original epiphany that I had looking out on that field of barley, all the barley in our whiskey is grown locally. And that Odyssey barley was grown by Philip and Michael Green who live a couple miles down the road. If you've heard of Blenheim Palace, where Churchill was born, that's about 15 minutes away. And these guys are tenant farmers on the Blenheim estate for a couple of, I think they're fifth generation farming family. So they grow the barley and then it gets taken down to an amazing place called Warminster Maltings, which is about 60 miles away near Bath, if you're familiar with Bath. And Warminster Maltings is Britain's mm-hmm. oldest working maltings. And it's a place where they still do floor malting. If you're familiar with floor malting, that's where you spread the barley out on long floors. Indeed. And while it germinates over a couple of days, you you hand turn it. And I thought it was just amazing that we were able to find these guys, which are actually the closest maltsers to us. So in terms of miles, we're minimizing that, Mm -hmm. but we're buying into this amazing bit of history. And if you're a whiskey geek like me, and you Whenever you get a chance to visit a distillery that still has a malting floor attached to it, even though if they're honest, they'll tell you they're only doing 1% mm-hmm. probably other on that floor. Yeah. Um, so basically it's us and Springbank. So we're in good company. I think we're the, the two main whiskeys that use 100% malted barley, floor malted barley. The Warminster brings that malted barley up to us and then we mill it, we mash it, we ferment it, we distill it, we age it, and then we bottle it. And 
So the, the Odyssey Barley, basically, that's our otherwise known as our flagship. And it's a blend of two casks. So it's 70% ex-red wine cask and 30% first filled bourbon. And the ex-red wine cask is the special okay. story because it's the, you may have heard the term STR cask, which was invented by Dr. Jim Swan, who advised us. And STR stands for shaved, toasted, and recharred. And Jim had an idea of making a cask that was super active and that extracted very quickly, even as a full size 225 liter cask, a wine cask. And he would get the cooper to take in an American oak red wine cask and shave that red layer from the wine off and expose the new wood, toast it for half an hour, and then char it, set it on fire like you would in Kentucky. And the combination of that wine in the staves, the fresh char and the toast just works wonder. And the character that you taste in that whiskey, when you say it's great for three years old, believe me, it actually came between six and 12 mm -hmm. months. It was already like that quickly. And the extra wow. two years were just a little bit more oxidation and evaporation. But so I, I think that SCR cask is just a genius thing. And it, and it creates, if you're familiar with Cavalan um, from Taiwan. I just got a box of that yesterday. We, we just received, received our sample bottles yesterday. We're interviewing Caitlin Tsai, their global ambassador shortly. So Cavalan basically was a product of the two guys that helped us out. So Jim Swan was a consultant to Cavalan and Harry Coburn helped commission the Forsyth stills that they had. Jim actually invented the STR cask when working with Cavalan. And when I first tasted the Vigno Barrique, which is the blue label of the Cavalan that won the best single malt in the world, that was before I even knew Jim. And then when I met him, I said, I just, I love that flavor because it's like, almost the day that Armagnac met bourbon, met single malt. It's got the fruitiness of the brandy and the kind of robustness of bourbon, but the sort of the delicateness of the of, of single malt. So Jim told me about the STR. So that's become a mainstay. And then the first fill bourbons are also lovely. And again, Jim really helped by introducing us to the best coopers out there in the world. The first fill bourbons that we're using are actually premium bourbon casks, mainly from Booker's and Basil Hayden's. And what's great about those small bourbon distilleries is unlike the larger ones, they're not steaming their casks after emptying them to get the last couple liters of bourbon. So they're coming to us like really juicy and fresh. And so that mix of bourbon. Ah, so you're getting wet casks. Yeah. And, and we typically will only use them for this kind of whiskey once for their first, because we want that really mm -hmm. active cask that puts in a lot of extract. The red wine cask, what kind of red wine? So people ask us that a lot. And what we explain is that it's not so much what brand of wine, but it's which part of Europe the wine is made in. So Jim's genius was to use a red wine cask that was made from American oak. And that typically is your Portuguese wines and your Spanish uh -huh. wines, everything that's made in a warmer climate where you don't want too much tannin. So this uh, particular cooperage, whose name of it is Diaz, which is just outside of Porto, gets its casks primarily from Douro Valley, Riojas, Alentejo wines. They'll, they will get some once in a while from California, even Israel, basically anytime it's an American oak cask. And so it's less the sort of the brand or the chateau or the vineyard, but really this process. The, the other whiskey that you have, our founder's choice, was made in, in homage to Jim Swan, who sadly passed away in 2016. But Jim was always so proud of the STR. And when I said, I want to combine it with a bourbon, he said, you might also want to just put out 100% STR and maybe put it at cast strength to differentiate it. And I, everybody I gave that to just raved about it. And I said, yeah, we've got to do this. And we did it in our second year, I think it was. And so that is 100% STR cask, no bourbon. And that is at cast strength. So it's 60.9 ABV. And that is three years old, although that we're now moving to five-year-old, recycling that in. And it's just, a, it's a lovely dram. This is it does, amazing. I, this is like 121 proof. And it drinks like maybe 85 as far as the heat goes if that's yeah that is we've gary and i have sampled a number of whiskeys that that drink much cooler than the numbers suggest they might and I, then I've, there's others that drink yes, exactly that's right are. that's right or drink hotter than the numbers but this the dissonance if you will between the numbers and the coolness of the drink that i've never encountered anything so dramatic well, thank you very much. And again, what we do try and do is we try and demystify that for folks. It's not dark arts. It's not black magic. It's simply if the spirit you make, if the new make spirit is great and you put it in really good wood, and this is something I know the Brooklady guys discovered is that, you know, the, some of the stocks that they inherited were in really not so great wood. 
And then the Jim McHugh and mm-hmm. Mark Renu started, you know, buying in good wood and re recasting, re racking into it. But we're really proud of our new make. Your new make is your new make available? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we actually sell it as a product, and we call it white pheasant, which is take on white dog. Oh, that's pretty. Um, I like white pheasant. Our, our, our symbol yeah. is the pheasant. Is that available for purchase in the U.S.? It is not yet. We're working on that. We are expanding the number of whiskeys that are going to be offered in the U.S. I think within the next couple of months, we're going to be offering our new sherry cask and our peated cask, which is a lot of fun. It's actually not peated barley, but it's our unpeated whiskey aged in ex Lafroy quarter cask for just a little light touch of smokiness. It just marries in really well. It's our distiller's favorite. They like to call it smoky vanilla ice cream. That's what it tastes. It's just, yeah. just that little, and it drinks at 59 ABV. So that's what is 100 and 118 proof. And it drinks like you wouldn't know that it was. There's that actually a couple I know in the Scotch Club that, that we belong to, and they actually have made uh, Lafroy vanilla ice cream and it is fantastic they homemade it and it was great your sherry whiskey is that is it fully sherry aged it is we don't do any finishing we do full term aging and everything so we say if Mm -hmm. you want to do a port cask whiskey then just hit that port cask with new make spirit and leave it alone for a couple of years so when it came time to do our first sherry release we said what are we going to do let's create a blend it's a sherry mashup. About 25% of it is Spanish oak. And that's just wonderful because that just gives it that little edge that the European oak does, that little extra tannic kind of bite, but not too much. And we just love it. This is our first year that we put it out last October and we made enough to go around for 12 months. And then our next batch will be a different mashup. And we'll just keep on doing that and just having fun with it. But it is 100% sherry, full-term aged in the sherry cask. Now, do you do you rebuild them and put various staves from each different barrel into a new barrel? Or do you just use the whole barrels and then blend it? I think if I suggested that to the distillers, I get a lot of distillers walking off the jaw. They are, we have the world, <laughs> they are just so crazy between the whiskey and the gin and the Amaros and the liqueurs and the, oh, it's just, there's so much going on, but we will refill the, those are the most expensive casks we use, those sherry casks, they are really expensive. We just got a load in last week, so I'm, I'm feeling that fresh in our payables, but they're <laughs> worth, I think the second fill, they'll still be absolutely lovely. So what we basically do is that about 35% of our uh, wood program program is STRs, brand new STRs, 30, 35% is the bourbons, first filled bourbons, then about 15, 20% is sherries. And then the remainder, well, then we've got the peated cask, the ex Lafroy quarter cask, which we get straight from Lafroy actually. And then we do these specials. So every year we get four parcels of five casks and we've done Pinot de Charente, we've done Sauterne, we've done rum, we've done Madeira, Port, we've done Tokai, we've done Vermouth, we've, you name it. We just And so every spring we put out a limited release and it's called Hearts and Crafts. That's the name of the release. And that's an homage to the um, arts and crafts movement, which flourished in the Cotswolds in the 19th century which stood for a return to traditional values of craftsmanship. So we thought that's perfect. That's what we're all about. And uh, our first Hearts and Crafts relief release was last spring, and it was a Sauterne cask, full term aged. And this one out in April, and that's a Pinot de Charente cask, that wonderful uh, aperitif from the Southwest. Ooh. I love Pinot de Charente. It's, it stands alone being fortified with cognac. It's special stuff. I, as Philip knows, I my favorite scotches, which is my favorite whiskeys, would be a sherry finished usually from the Speyside region. With what you're saying you're doing with your sherry whiskeys, I'm very excited to taste them because this is, I feel like, your whiskeys are the closest to Scotch whiskeys that I've tasted that are made outside of Scotland, which is a good thing in my book because I think they're fantastic, but they yet have their own distinct flavors, which I also like. As soon as the sherry is available in the U.S., please let me know because I would like to run out and get a, get a bottle. A- absolutely. Absolutely. Question. When the Cotswolds Distillery opened, uh, how many English whiskey makers were there? We were the third, I believe, maybe the fourth, actually, because the first one was actually was a small cider maker in, in Cornwall that did a little bit of whiskey, very small. And then there was the English Whiskey Company in Norfolk, um, a distillery called St. George's Distillery, and then a brewer in Suffolk called Adnams that started making whiskey. So we were, let's say, number four, and there's now like 24. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty amazing. English okay. whiskey is That's, taken off. I mean, explosive is, there's no other word. Yeah. And of course, we see the same thing happening in Ireland, where, of course, there's a deep tradition of whiskey making, but it's gone from two to in the dozens. 
Yeah, absolutely. There there was a, a tradition of whiskey making in England, but unfortunately that sort of died out. I guess the end of the 19th century, start of the 20th century. I think the Lee Valley Distillery was the last mm -hmm. one was uh, in, mm -hmm. in business, mainly focused around blends. But then again, so were most of the distilleries in Scotland back then, single malt being a relatively new thing. Sure. So we're bringing it back. Yeah. And, and it's amazing, thanks to gin, actually, there's now more distilleries in England than there are in Scotland, believe it or not. Wow. That's crazy. That's outstanding. Outstanding. Yeah. Just amazing. A question about the distillery experience. We see that, that the visitor experience there is has been seemingly well curated. You, the, there's a focus on it. And you offer a great many gin and whiskey blending masterclasses. I assume participants are able to take away their creations? Absolutely. That's that's the idea. I mean, you know, whiskey blending, I, I think, has been wrongly cloaked in this air of mystery and science and whatever. But you can be a whiskey blender in your kitchen and it's fun. I always encourage people. And when you got a little bit of this glass, a little bit of that glass, bosh them together, see what you like, see how it changes the flavor. And it's not no more complicated than that at its most simple. Obviously, it can be elevated to a huge art. But what we do in our whiskey blending masterclass is we give people a chance to try four cask samples straight from the cask at both cask strength and brought down a 46, which is important for them to see the difference in taste and then decide what they like out of those eight samples right. and just put them together any way they want and walk out with a bottle of their own blended malt. And uh, it's just a lot of fun. And we do the same thing in gin where you've got about 30 different botanical distillates and you can make your own gin the way you want it. So it's always been really important that's to awesome. me to welcome people um, to the distillery because that's how I got into this from visiting distilleries. And I always said, all I want is to make a whiskey I'd want to drink in a distillery I'd want to visit. And, and so when I see these kind of smiling, happy faces walking around, we do three tours a day, seven days a week. It's just wonderful. And that's the saddest part of the last year, having to have stopped that, really. But we're hoping to get it going again in the next month. Now, are you guys opening up? Yeah, we'll open up the shop. Uh, so April 12th is the first day that we can do that in the UK. And we'll also open up our cafe for outdoor dining only. And then the tours will start up again in the middle of May. But we're expecting a pretty busy summer because there's going to be a lot of staycationers, as they say in the UK, people who don't want to really leave the UK and are looking mm, for sure. the most beautiful parts of the country to go spend their holidays. And the Cotswolds always gets a huge number of visitors. And we've actually got another couple of stores well in local villages. We want to talk about this book that you've written. You wrote a book. Um, I was reading it the other day. And what I loved is, first of all, I loved your, your quote of Mr. Miyagi in the very beginning. That is fantastic. Lesson for whole life, have balance, everything be better, Mr. Miyagi. When I started reading that, I'm like, this sounds like, Ms. oh, it is Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> so <that's great. laughs> um, but what I loved here is on the very first page of the actual book, uh, in number one, Taking Stock, you talk about how all these things that you're doing isn't the spirits, but this book is about, let me find the sentence, because I, I think it's perfect for what we're trying to achieve with Spirits at Whiskey. This book is about the other kind of spirit, that of individuals and the times we find ourselves in. That's totally what we are trying to do here with Spirits of Whiskey. The origin of the name for this podcast actually was for one of the renditions of the pilots that I was doing before, and it was called Spirit of Whiskey. And I had a host going around and we were talking about the Spirit of Whiskey. And when I brought the idea to Philip, I said, let's use that as the name. And he said, we're going to be going to the people and it's going to be the, the Spirits of the people. So let's make it Spirits of Whiskey. And I said, okay. Let's do that. Makes sense. So I, I was really excited to read that in the very first page. So tell us, tell us about the book. Tell us what inspired it. Is this your first book? And g give us some background on this yeah, bad well, boy. It, it, it's the first book. It may very well be the last book. Who knows whether there's going to be another <laughs> chapter in my life that's book worthy. But this one, I, I did feel that my, as some people have joked, my hedge funds to hedge rows experience was kind of a um, Wall Street guy finds redemption in the countryside, simpler values, a more meaningful life. And you know what? The best part of all that is it's true because it happened to me. And I felt like what I ought to be doing is telling that story to anyone who's ever had those thoughts and in the way that I did for years, just pushing them down, saying, no, that's just daydreaming. Don't, you can't do that. And for a number of reasons, the number of factors, fate brought things together, I ended up going for following this dream and taking the leap 
and I've never regretted it for a day. And so my goal was to get to people who were thinking in that way and talk to them. As I said in the book, I don't want to write a whiskey geek book and I don't want to write, as I call them, an airport book, sort of a business, how to be better in business CEO kind of book, whatever. I wanted to write a book about just following your dreams and not being afraid to do that. And lockdown seemed a perfect time to, to do that. And I think that probably this past year has seen more people question their life choices than ever before. So what I'm talking about is maybe Me. less you. <laughs> Me. But, um, of course, I question those every day, sometimes at three in the morning. I've been thinking of it as, as you were talking about earlier, Daniel, that you were 26 years into this profession that you didn't really like. And as much as I do like the film and, and television industry, the particular job that I hold is not the job that I wanted to be in. But once you got good at that position, that's where they keep putting you. So I feel like this year off being able to uh, produce things with Philip and getting to do the part of the industry in which I've always wanted to do, in which I went to college for and have a degree in. Yeah, this is one of the reasons I'm, I'm in love with your book. We've taken this last year. I have a background in production as well, first theatrical and then film and television. And we've taken this year, Gary and I together working in partnership to develop a slate of culinary media culinary entertainment, spirits, cocktails, food. And this is just the beginning. Yeah. All right, great. With, I tell people, I, I talk to young sort of distillers, startup distillers, would-be distillers, and I tell them that I did this without realizing I was going into the drinks business. And they laugh and they think I'm telling a joke. And, I, and then usually I say, show of hands, the groups I speak to, how many of you have been in the drinks business before? And very few have. And most people who go to craft distilling are doing it to follow a sort of a passion, but they don't realize that there's a whole industry behind this. I had no idea that I was going into the drinks business. I just wanted to make whiskey. And I thought well, whiskey, I don't know, some people just buy it. It just sells itself. And then I realized that, oh, gosh, to make this work, <laughs> there's a lot of things that I had never really thought about. Scale, route to market, channels, all sorts of. And I won't say that's the most exciting part of it. What I do think is really important is, is that I went into it for good reasons, not typical reasons. Most people don't go into it just for the love of it. And, and I think some people also believe that I, you know, oh, there's this really well-off guy who's with a hedge fund and this is like a hobby. This is not a hobby. I didn't do that with the hedge fund. I, I did well enough to get into trouble, but not well enough to pull it off. It's really, this is the story that I wanted to get out and just un, uh, make people understand why I did this, what's involved and what I learned about myself through it. And uh, I had some help with it. There's an amazing company called Story Terrace, which is a startup company that actually helps put people with a story to tell together with folks who can help them tell it, whether it's helping on the writing or the formatting or the publishing, the self-publishing and giving it out to Amazon. And so I worked with an amazing woman author who we just hit it off and her brilliance was taking 20, 30 hours of just rambling and putting it together with some really, you know, easy to read and fun to read sort of prose. I was really happy with it. Don't know if there's another book in it, but I just hope people enjoy it and it helps inspire them a little bit. Well, it inspired me for sure. And it will inspire one lucky winner because we are going to be doing a giveaway for this book. Thank you, Daniel, for sending an extra so that we could send it off. I can't wait to see more come up here in the U.S., and I think that leads us to cocktails. We got to get you guys out to the Cotswolds. You got to come pay us a visit. Oh, I think Absolutely. So. so cocktails, do you drink them? I do. When you're out at a bar and your products are not on the back bar, where do you go? What do you order? Or what do you do at home? Oh, gosh. Yeah. This has been one, one, of, my, one of my little uh, lockdown, yeah, shameful uh, indulgences is that I, I built a really very nice bar. I got an old empty. Oh, shame. Bar. For shame. <laughs> It's a, Only so one? I have hour. one inside and one outside. Come on, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> cocktail hour has become really quite fun. And look, I guess I got to start things. I do give equal time to, to gin and to whiskey, and I like them both in cocktails. On the whiskey side, I tend to really go for the traditionals. I love my Manhattans. I love my old fashions. I, I love to make an old fashioned with maple syrup from my old summer camp, which is in Lake Placid, New York, which they very kindly send me a bottle once oh, a year. Fun. And it's just awesome stuff. Wow. And Founder's Choice, by the way, the, the blue label whiskey there that you had makes an awesome old fashioned because in terms of dilution, holding its own, and no it's got that bourbon-y kind of quality can, to I it. I totally believe that. Of, so so that's, uh, that's wonderful. And I'm a big vermouth fan. Manhattans are great. Martinez's with our old Tom Jim. We even do our own vermouth where we've paired a Cotswold wine with some wonderful botanicals. And, and the list goes on. I, I love basically all the gin cocktails 
work really well with the classic gin cocktails, work really well with our gin. So Cotswold's Cloudy Martini and the Negroni, it, it marries very well. With, they all really do a, do a very good job. Sounds awesome. That The Martinez, we covered that in one of our video series called Cocktails the Grand Tour with Jonathan Pogash. Episode three is all about the Martinez and we did the slow gin. And I have yet to make one myself, but now that I have your the old regular time. gin, I'm going to try it with that because this is, again, one of the best gins I've ever had. That's great. Oh, well done. Well done. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's there's another one that is, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Soho House. I know they've got a few out in LA, I think. They've oh, got, yeah. Yeah, there are two here. I think. Yeah, they about 15 minutes from us is a place called Soho Farmhouse, and it was their first attempt to do a big hotel-based sort of a thing. Our gin and whiskey are in all the rooms, which is wonderful, but they do a cocktail, which is actually based on a tequila. It's called a Picante de la Casa, but our Bahara gin, which is this sort of Middle Eastern, very cardamom-infused gin, works really well with it. And you basically just put your gin or your tequila, a bunch of jalapenos, cilantro, you muddle it up along with a bit of agave nectar and lime, shake it put it together and you've got this amazing spicy kind of just really gorgeous drink on the rocks. So picante de la casa. That sounds amazing. I love, love spicy stuff. Love it. Oh, love it. Yeah. All right. Daniel, this has been fantastic. It's I been can't a delight. wait. Yes. Thank I you. can't wait to finish your book. I'm quite a, quite a bit in, but I'm very, this fantastic book and your whiskeys are, and your gin are truly fantastic. And I'm, you're now my favorite English producer of booze quite honestly. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for taking the time out and talking with us today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Cheers. World of Wheezy is up next. Stay with us. Hey, Louise, it's great to have you here today. Um, today, we're going to visit the Cotswolds in England. It's a lovely little area where they started making whiskey and gin. And we had Daniel Shore on and he told us how he ended up there from New York and told us all about his whiskey journey and then how gin came along with it. It's a very interesting story. So speaking of gin and whiskey from the Cotswolds, they supplied us with two whiskeys and a gin. What did you want to do with one of those today? I went for the gin. Here's the thing. I've been pairing a lot of whiskeys. It is a show about whiskey. I get that. But you give me a gin, I'm going to pair the gin. It's also... Gin is one of my favorite spirits. I, I jumped on that. And this particular one had such a rich herbal presence. It had a lavender and like oh, yeah. mint and wild minty flavors, as well as citrus. I picked up some, I don't know if it was lemon or grapefruit or whatnot, but all of that being said, I really love a super herbaceous gin like this. Now, you know, I like a very juniper forward gin as well, but when I have a gin like this, I think about mixing it with tonic. I like that it goes cloudy once you mix it. And that really is refreshing on a summer day. I was imagining that if I was having such a gin, probably it would be an aperitif. I would, it would be pre-dinner. And then I was thinking, what would I want to eat with that pre-dinner? I would want some caviar. VR. I would want some homemade potato chips. And then I also thought I could make a creme. Wait, butter. homemade potato chips. That is correct. Homemade potato chips. I would make a lavender citrus creme fraiche and I would top it with caviar. And my deal with caviar is this, buy what you can afford. If you can afford the good shit, buy it, treat yourself. If you can't, buy the more affordable stuff. There is great caviar in every price range. You just have to do your research. You know what? Some salmon roe, some salty salmon roe, which is not expensive, would be delicious on here. Or, hey, you're baller, you wanna go with some Ocetra? Go right ahead. So that would be my pairing with this gin. And I'm telling you, it's making me drool just thinking about it right now. What's funny is you talk about that. And the only time that I ever had really good caviar, I actually got to take out of the taste kitchen at the end of the season when they had leftovers. They said, OK, you can go shopping in our kitchen. And I was like, oh, I have never had the really good stuff. So I'm going to I'm going to grab that. So that's a, the flashback to when we met. <laughs> I think I actually used that very caviar in one of my dishes. <laughs> I think you did. All right, cool. Well, I can't wait to try this homemade potato chips with the caviar and the lavender citrus. Sounds fantastic. 
I didn't really taste the gin until we talked with Daniel. I mean, I've had a, we've had a couple of really good gins on the show, and I've always liked gin, but I haven't. I think the gins that we've had on the show so far have been the best gins that I've had, honestly. And I can say that too about the botanist because I that was when I was in Isla. I knew for sure I was like, this is great. I love it. So I think we've got some pretty good gins on the show. <laughs> All right, Louise, thank you so much for being here, and I can't wait to see what we talk about next week. All right, I'll speak to you next week. Cheers. Thank you. For show notes on today's podcast, please visit our website at spiritsofwhiskey.com. That's whiskey with an E. We'll include links and supporting documents from today's stories in this episode's blog post. As always, you'll see upcoming topics, a guest roster, and links to past shows. Sign up to become a VIP member of Spirits of Whiskey. With your membership, you'll have access to various spin-off series, including The Malting Floor, Tales from the Still, and our Telly Award-winning series, Kindred Spirits. To learn how, visit our website and click on the pop-up button. While there, enter to win a copy of Daniel Shore's book, Spirit Guide in Search of an Authentic Life, through the banner at the top of the homepage. And for those of you who just can't wait, you can purchase a copy online in our whiskey shop, as well as other books from previous guests. If you run a whiskey club, or if you're a member of one, and you'd like your work featured in the Spirits of Whiskey Club Corner, send us an email via our website contact form, or leave us a voice message on our anchor page. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, Slanchava! Spirits of Whiskey is produced by First Reel Entertainment and the Center for Culinary Culture, home of the Cocktail Collection, and is available via Anchor, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are heard.